Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and assembled company, wherever you are, and whatever time of day it is, welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe and connecting the world by story. And we're connecting a few bits of the world tonight. We're connecting East Anglia, other parts of England. I never think about East Anglia as part of England. You're in East Anglia, as I found you on a Woodbridge uh, site the other day. I assume you're in East Anglia, Jane. There. I am indeed, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I thought you were a Suffolk girl. And uh, so, uh, and uh, then we got Orla in, um, in Ireland and Norman in Canada. And we have guests, uh, we have guests from Romania and all sorts of places. Oh, you know. So, so without further, what would our, what, our theme tonight be concerned? Monday nights are always if we can if we can mute while we're not telling that'd be great um and Monday nights are always themed and uh, our theme tonight is access or lack of it and I actually thought of this you know this thing because I heard Jane do a poem the other day and I thought well that'll make a program <laughs> and, uh, so so uh, if you could unmute yourself Jane and uh, without further ado, could you please put your hands together and welcome Jane Martin. Thank you very much. Yes, well, when I'm not lounging comfortably in an armchair, um, I get around the place by the aid of various wheeled conveyances. Um, I have a wheelchair, I have an electric wheelchair, which we call Davros, and I have a mob mobility scooter. So this poem is called Ramp Rant. We wheeled people, obsessed with access, it's true. Wouldn't you if you couldn't get to or through the places you wanted to? One small step for a leg is a huge deal for a wheel. In 1995, the mighty government strove to take steps against steps and stairs in ones or pairs. It saw that a law was needed to stop we wheeled people from being impeded. Reasonable adjustments, unreasonably instructed, must be made, they said. But this just meant many a business could make the decision to ignore the law, carry on as before. Of course, there was no one to enforce the rules the fools in power had made so vague. Unless we wheeled people took steps, took owners to court to thwart their thoughtlessness, there was no redress. New buildings grew with slopes and ramps. These champs gave hope. And slowly, but surely, a new movement of upward tilting flatness grew, ramped up, sloped into view. In light of our plight, you may look aghast. Think, what an arse when I start my ramp rant. I'd climb on a soapbox, yell from the rooftops if I were able, if my balance were stable, if I could make the step to step up and speak out, to shout about the absence of sense in those well-meaning guys who try to make up for the makeup of their doorway, but do so in a poor way. You don't need a fandangled degree to think about angles and degrees and not dampen we wheeled people's ardour for ingress with a ramp so steep it's harder to mount than Everest. And the fear of awkward slipping, tipping backward, haphazard, pride shattered, the impact of that would disincline the hardiest of we wheeled people to make the incline. So angles anger me, but my ramp rant hasn't ended. Don't be offended by my frustration if you've attempted to help the situation. It should be some compensation to know we wheeled people love you for trying. Indeed, even if you don't succeed, while we're sighing or crying at our unmet need, we realise to be wise in all things is unrealistic. But please don't be the dipstick who gets a ramp for a space too cramped. Curb all inklings of absurd slopes that leave we wheeled people teetering on the curb edge like perched seabirds on a ledge, parious precipice poised, one wavering wheel and crash, smashed flesh, 
mangled metal, limbs like pretzels, wrong angled, entangled wrists and ankles, wheeled roadkill, still, lifeless. One driver's life lessened by a lesson not learned by another. Size is important. My ramp rant can't end with this downward slide into melancholy. Well, golly, did you think it would be jolly? But it would be folly to close with such a dose of doom. Instead, I leave with a plea. Take steps to level the playing field, saying wheeled people are included, but don't be deluded. Not any ramp will suffice. Wouldn't it be nice to save so much vexation with just a little consultation? Thank you. That's that's my uh, my my views on on the, the joy and otherwise of ramps. Um, and I'd like to um, to add to that, I've got a, a story. It's not about um, the plights of, of those of us who use who use wheeled conveyances more often than about our fellow man. Um, it's this is a story. It's um, it's about living in Lowestoft, where we have our own very particular um, access problems. We are a, a seaside town. We're the most easterly point in um, Britain. And we are divided by an inlet. So we are a town of two halves. So as all good stories start, once upon a time in the town of Lowestoft, in the very, very most easterly point of the UK, there was a bridge. And the bridge spanned the sharp inlet that divided the town in two. And it was an essential part of town life because fishing was a big thing in Lowestoft. It was, it was our primary trade. It was what fed the people. And we took our fish into the rest of East Anglia. And we made a name for ourselves in Lowestoft many, many years ago as a, as a fishing port of some repute. And... The bridge that we built needed to move. We needed to be able to, to lift it up to let through the boats so the fishing fleet could come in to the natural harbour formed by this inlet. And then the bridge could go down to let the people of Lowestoft flow from north to south and do their, their, their shopping and their farming and all, all the other things that needed to, to go on to make sure that they had a healthy diet that didn't just consist of fish. And then one day, the troll arrived. Bascule the troll. He came from who knows where, but one day suddenly he appeared and he decided he liked the bridge. And the bridge was to be his and he would not allow anyone to cross. He would not allow the people to cross from north to south. He would not allow the boats to come in and out from east to west. And so the fishing fleet stayed out at sea and had to find another means of landing. And the people were separated, families from families, friends from friends, by this, this inlet of water that stopped them from getting to one side to the other, and by the troll who had just taken ownership of the bridge. Well, they tried to, to find ways around. They, they tried to, to shout to each other and have conversations across the water, but that that just wasn't wasn't working. The wind that howls along the east coast would take their words and throw them out to sea or throw them into land, but they would not be able to have conversations across the water. They they attempted to, to send letters via paper aeroplane, but the same happened. The wind blew the aeroplanes, they landed in the water, they got soggy, they sunk, and that didn't work either. They tried with fishing lines. They tried with the, the, the sea fishermen who, who fish from the shore. They used their long lines and they, they flipped across to try and send things 
to the other shore with their fishing lines. But this was still not really inadequate. There's no, no replacement for being able to cross the bridge and, and see their friends and family on the other side. So some brave souls, sometimes they would, they would try to, to tiptoe across the bridge, hoping that the troll wouldn't hear them at tip, tip, tip tippy toe across the bridge ever so quietly and the troll would pop up and go who's that creeping over my bridge and he'd grab them with a big hand <laughs> eat them all up some other brave souls occasionally they try a different tactic they thought if i can get across the bridge really really quickly the troll won't catch me and set off and they'd run and they'd run and they'd run and they'd run across the bridge but they weren't fast enough because the troll would pop up and he would go, who's that running over my bridge? And he'd grab them with his big hand <laughs> and he'd eat them all up. So the townsfolk thought about this, the townsfolk on the north and the townsfolk on the south, and they couldn't communicate with each other. Um, so they couldn't make a concerted plan where they came together and attacked the troll. But one day, a group from the north, intrepid north Lowestofters like myself, decided that if they went en masse, maybe they could fight off the troll. So they put on their biggest boots and they took their weapons and they marched onto the bridge, determined they would not be beaten by the troll. Who's that stomping onto my bridge, said the troll. And with a wave of his hand, he smacked them all into the sea and then picked them out one by one and ate them all up. Wow. They were beside themselves. The townsfolk of Lowestoft had no idea what they were going to do. The fishermen had, had made a sort of temporary harbour they were managing to land the fish but it wasn't ideal there was no room really they had to come in one at a time and the people themselves were, were missing each other they were missing their friends and their family from the other side of the bridge until one day young Billy O'Scruff came to the bridge and he called to the troll he didn't set foot on the bridge he stayed on the land and he said Baskill the troll, I would like to have a word with you. I would like parley. And Baskill the troll rose up from under his bridge with his big head. Parley? You think I'm a pirate troll? Billy O'Scruff said, well, you might be a pirate troll, you might not, but I want to talk to you anyway. It looks like you're here. So I would like to challenge you to a fight, to a battle. I would like to battle with you. And the troll laughed a huge laugh. <laughs> you, a young Billy O'Scruff, you want to do battle with me? I am Bascule the Troll. The old scruff was not to be phased. He said, yes, I would. I would like to do battle with you. And the conditions of the battle will be that if I win, you will do whatever I ask. You will make sure that the people can cross this bridge from north to south. You will make sure that the ships, the, the fishing boats can, can come into harbour and can come in and out east to west. Is that a deal? And Bascule the Troll said, yes, <laughs> whatever. I'll agree to all your terms because you're going to battle me. <laughs> and Billy O'Scroft wasn't faced. He said, yeah, yeah, OK. So you've agreed to that. And uh, and the other thing is I want to choose the weapon. <laughs> but, yeah, well, I don't see a problem with that. I don't see what weapon you could possibly choose that's going to help you win a battle with me, <laughs> said Baskill the Troll. So Billy Scruff said, right, they were agreed then. And um, I will be back here for our battle tomorrow at noon. So the Troll chuckled to himself and went back under his bridge and 
uh, carried on being a troll for until the next day at, at, at noon. And, uh, and he came back up and there was Billy O'Scruff. And the troll said, I see no weapons, Billy O'Scruff. What, what weapon have you decided to use against me, the mighty bascule troll? And Billy O'Scruff said, well, I have chosen to use words, bascule the troll. Words? What kind of weapon is that? Well, it's the weapon I've chosen, said Billy O'Scruff. Oh, well, well, I don't know about that, but a deal's a deal, so bring on your words, young Billy O'Scruff, said Bascule the Troll. And Billy O'Scruff said, if you can tell me the answer to my question, then you may keep the bridge. If you cannot tell me the answer to my question, then you must fulfill your side of the bargain and you must let us cross from north to south and you must let the fishing boats come in from east to west. Is that okay? The troll said, well, I don't know, she's enormously fair or words, what kind of woman is that? But uh, uh, all right then. So Billy O'Scroff said, what can run but never walks, has a mouth but never talks, has a bed but never sleeps, has a head but never weeps? Rescue the troll scratched his chin. And he scratched his head. And he thought about it. He said, I don't like this. This isn't fair. What kind of battle is this? I'm a troll. Can run but never walks. That's a stupid thing, isn't it? What kind of thing is that? Uh, runs and doesn't walk. If you can't walk, you can't run. It's a mouth but never talks. What's the point in a mouth if you're not going to talk? As a bed but never sleep. So why would you have a bed if you're not going to sleep? You know, I don't know. As a head but never weeps. Well, I've got a head and I've never wept. It's not a troll because I've got a bed and I do sleep. Never mouth and do talk. And, and I can't really run because I'm too big. But I do walk, so it's not a troll. I don't know. But yes, Gruff said, I'm going to have to hurry you, Bascule Troll, because we haven't got all day, you know, to wait for you to think about. So Bascule Troll said, wait a minute, we didn't put a time limit on this battle. And he went on thinking and went on scratching his head. And the, the townsfolk were gathering on both sides of the inlet either side of the bridge and finally Bascule the Troll had to admit defeat. He could not figure out the answer to Billy O'Scroft's question. Oh, 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 okay, all right, all right, you've won. I can't answer your stupid question. What is the answer? Billy O'Scroft said. Well, what can run but never walks, has a mouth but never talks? as a bed but never sleeps, as a head but never weeps. It's a river, of course, Bascule the Troll. Anyone with half a brain could have figured that out. And Bascule the Troll is very angry now. He's very angry that he's been insulted. And his face goes red and he wants to growl. He sees all these people and he wants to pick them up. But if there's one thing that a troll will always do, it's keep a promise. And so, from that day to this, Bascule the Troll still lives by the bridge, but instead of stopping people from crossing, his new job is to open the bridge and let the boats through and lower the bridge and let the people across. And if you come to Lowestoft and you are close to the bridge, when it opens to let the boats through and lowers to let the people cross, you will hear Bascule the troll groaning as he hoiks the bridge up. He goes. And from that day to this, the bridge in Lowestoft has been called the Bascule Bridge. Right, thank you very much. Whoa. Thank you, Jane. And I can 
testify to that. I used to run writing workshops in a prison to the north side of, of Lowestoft uh, three times a week. And I had to choose between coming across that bridge. And let me tell you, that <laughs> troll raises that bridge incredibly slowly. So the traffic backs up for miles or going miles inland. And uh, which was uh, and across the Norfolk Broad. So Jane, fantastic. And of course, I have to uh, I have to thank Justine Demers and her Taps and Tales, which is where I I uh, rediscovered Jane uh, when she had that magnificent poem last week or two weeks ago. So thank you very much, Jane Martin. Thank you. Right. Let us. We we went from the most eastern part, uh, easternmost point of uh, uh, of the British Isles, and we'll travel west. And we won't go by road, and we won't go by boat. We'll better go by magic carpet, I think, because otherwise it'll take far too long. And please, could you put your hands together and welcome Oliver Govan? <laughs> Thanks a million. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks, everyone. It's lovely to be here on a Monday in great company. And uh, I think, John, when you said the title of the, the theme for tonight, immediately the first thing that came to me was a, a personal story, a true story. And um, I run a night in Galway where we have all sorts of stories, including true stories, but I haven't been telling any uh, in a while. So I thought tonight I might tell you a, a true story personal one. So for any of you that have worked in the arts or work in the arts, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of a scramble to make a living and and uh, you're you're taking little bits of jobs here and little bits of jobs there and you're taking another kind of job to support this job. Well, it's even worse if you live in the US. Sometimes uh, you're taking all sorts of little jobs and, and things to support yourself as, a, as an artist. And I was working as an actor and a storyteller and a writer at the time. And to make matters even worse, my partner uh, was also working in the arts. So that's double the amount of little things you have to do. My partner was a musician and a busker. So we had to kind of chisel out times to have a, almost like a date afternoon. You had to make this a priority. We didn't live together at the time. So we really had to work at finding time to spend together, quality time. So when a Sunday came along that we were both free, we were delighted. And this has actually gone in the calendar in, in red ink as date day. This cannot be disturbed. This is sacred. No more plans. It's date day. So we planned a, a gorgeous day. The weather was lovely. It was predictable in Seattle at the time, unlike Ireland, where it changes every five minutes. But uh, we decided we would go for a lovely picnic or a walk down to the sea or just to take in a bit of nature. Well, just before we were about to set off, the phone rang. My partner's phone rang. And on the other end was a man called Jim Page. And I don't know if any of you know Jim Page. This is not Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. <laughs> this is Jim Page, who is a fantastic musician from the Pacific Northwest, uh, a singer and songwriter, and he's toured all over the world. And he's a, a musician's musician. He's friends with a lot of very famous people because he writes these incredible songs. So look him up afterwards and have a listen to his tunes. Jim was a really good friend of Nicole's. And Jim said, look, I'm after getting two VIP access all areas tickets to the Bonnie Raitt concert in the San, San Michel winery in Woodenville near Seattle. Now, if anybody doesn't know Bonnie Raitt, another little sidestep, please look up Bonnie Raitt afterwards. She had a couple of kind of uh, poppy hits, I think, in the UK in the 80s and 90s, but her real legendary musical style is, is blues and country. And she was an incredible woman in music for many, many years. And um, she fought many demons and overcame them. And she's just been an inspiration to many musicians, especially women in, in music. And my partner idolized Bonnie Raitt. So there was Jim on the phone offering two, not three, two VIP tickets for himself and Nicole to go to Bonnie Raitt. 
and her face you could see was like the changing weather it was oh i'm so excited oh no i can't it's date day oh i'm so excited oh no i can't date them well of course of course of course i insisted that you know the concert has to be gone to these are vip tickets so we come up with a little bit of a compromise I decide to take a little packed lunch and a book with me. I'm going to go out with them in the car to this beautiful winery on the outskirts of Seattle, out in the countryside. I'm going to sit in the grass with a blanket. I might be able to hear a few tunes over the hill and let them go inside and have their super posh VIP access all areas tickets. So off we went. And in the car on the way, Jim, who's incredibly generous, said, you know what, I probably know some of the crew on this concert. Now, I couldn't get another VIP pass, but maybe maybe I can get you in. I can just get you into the gig. It's sold out, but, you know, it's us. We'll figure something out. So this was a little glimmer of hope for me because I also love Bonnie Raitt and the support act was Keb Moe, another great musician. So I was really looking forward to at least trying this. So we arrived at the winery and everybody's got their picnic baskets and it's all very posh and lovely and the sun is beaming down and Jim goes up and he has a word with one of the one of the crew that he spots walking out near the gate. No sooner does he do that, I'm in. I get a general admission. I'm in with the two of them in. I'm going to see the concert. I am over the moon. So we walk around for a little bit and then we see the VIP section and the VIP section has about 40 people in it and these people have chairs and these people are dressed really nicely and they have suits and there's a lot of security. It's a very kind of a posh venue and there's a lot of people. They don't want any riffraff going into the VIP area, understandably. So of course we take this as another challenge and see what we can do. <laughs> Nicole remembers the old trick of licking your arm with a stamp and sticking it on somebody else's arm and the sticky part will transfer over. But they have a stamp, I have a different stamp, but they also have these laminate VIP passes. So we walk up and we see, are they inspecting the full VIP pass? No, they're just looking at the little one on the arm. So... There's an arm licking, there's a stamp, and I whistle. Don't ever whistle, it makes you look really suspicious. I whistle, and I walk in, and I'm in the VIP section. Now, the danger isn't over yet. There's an exact amount of seats. There's bouncers walking up and down. So when people get to their feet, you can sort of sneak in. But if they see you don't have a seat and you're standing at the side, they can kick you out. So Bonnie Raitt comes on stage and she's from, from here to the, to the kitchen away from me. She's right in front of me and she's her lovely curly red hair of grey that she's famous for. And we are just in awe. But I have to keep moving seats so I look like I'm not the same person who doesn't have a seat. And people stand up and dance and I shift over this way. And a bouncer gets very suspicious of me, but at that stage it's too late and she's coming onto the encore and it's been an amazing, amazing gig. So we go and we pack up and we leave and then Jim says to Nicole, would you like to meet Bonnie? Because they're good friends and they've known each other a long time. Now Bonnie's dressing room and the after area is, it's like Fort Knox, there's three three layers of security there's no way I'm going near there and I said look you go on go on and meet her I know you really want to meet her um I will wait out in the car go on go on inside and Jim looks at me and he said are you sure you don't want to try and get in well if you know me well you'd know I love a challenge and a little bit of mischief but I had no VIP badge I had no access all area it was one of those those hologram ones that are very posh and you had to stick it on your your coat and it, they would shine a light on it and I presume they would ask you for your firstborn child as well but they anyway I walked up to the edge and I just convinced myself that I was wearing a badge and sure enough the security guard flashed a light 
stopped everyone, flashed a light, flashed a light. I just looked up, smiled at him. I didn't whistle this time, just smiled at him and he waved me in. I was in past the first level. The second level we went through, there was a, a kind of a bunch of us went through together with some very famous people. I don't know who they are, but they looked like they were famous. We walked through there. We're in past the second level. Now there's just one more level to get by. And then I'm in backstage, well, at the special VIP area with Jim and Nicole. Again, I, I summoned all my Jedi mind tricks that I could, everything I'd learned from watching sci-fi, and I thought, I am wearing an Access All Areas badge. I'm wearing a badge. I'm wearing a badge. And I could see the bouncer's eyes looking at me. He caught something about me. And he looked down, and he stopped, and he picked up the light, and he shone it at me. And he let me in! I have no idea why. He saw this mind meld, mind trick, magical hologram badge that I had managed to manifest on my coat and he let me in. I was inside, I was downstairs, there were lots of famous people looking to see who else was here that was famous and there was lots of food everywhere and champagne and wine for the guests. But I noticed Jim slip up this small back stairs. And Nicole was in front of him and nobody had said anything to me. So I just slipped up the back stairs and followed them. I turned a corner and there I was in this tiny little room. And there was a man in the corner that I kind of recognised. And I went, oh, that's, that's Tom Robbins, the writer. <laughs> the man who wrote Even Cowgirls Get the Blues. I recognise him. And the next thing, in walks Bonnie Raitt. And Nicole is sort of like this and Bonnie gives gives Jim a big hug and, and Jim introduces Nicole and Nicole shakes hands and he goes to introduce me and he said and this is my friend Orla and Bonnie goes I know Orla I've met Orla about five years ago at, at uh, another festival at the Womad festival with her friend Donal Lunny and this was true I had met Bonnie Raitt for a split second backstage five years before and she remembered me she remembered that I worked in theatre and I was so impressed. Well, we sat down and we were there for about an hour chatting and Bonnie had this little blind poodle that jumped up on our lap and played with us. Bonnie Raitt was bringing us tortilla chips, offering us beer and Coke. She doesn't drink herself, but she had a fridge full for her guests. And I think Nicole thought she was in heaven. So we kind of have a rule. 10 years later, we now live together we have a rule that it's okay to skip date night once an adventure is on the cards. And that's my story. And I might just ask Nicole to turn on her camera for a second to be really cheeky and see, will you give us a wave? She's got her lovely red hair like Bonnie Wraith. <laughs> Sorry for embarrassing you, Nicole. <laughs> oh, fantastic, fantastic. I remember there's, there's, a, there's a young... He's not, uh, well, I suppose he's about 16 now, but there's a young singer called Ned, calls himself Ned Dillon. And uh, he was, uh, he, uh, at 12 years old, he wrote uh, a review of Bob Dylan or something and sent it into an online, uh, on online magazine. And they said, would they go, would he go and review all the festivals for him, uh, for, for them? And he said, yeah, if I can take my parents, I'm only 12. <laughs> and so he, so he always got press passes for his parents as well. And we're at Cambridge Folk Festival. And I had my backstage, you know, sort of uh, access area and just, um, and uh, there was someone Ned really wanted to interview. So I squeezed him in backstage and, uh, uh, and there's, you know, it's kind of, a, it, it, it's because it's an open air festival, you know, they're all sitting around their, you know, white plastic chairs and white, and white tables. And I'd say, you know, like, don't try and talk to her before she goes on stage, you know, but wait till she comes off. So there was a point, and it, you, there's, there's always a right point for approaching the, the people. And I said, Ned, now, and he went in and he got his interview. And uh, a year later, he, um, he, he was, um, he, he, he was going to another festival and he needed a, he needed another chaperone. 
and his mum couldn't do it. So he said, she, so, so do I want to come along? And I had a press, I'd never had a press pass. All these years of working festivals, I'd never had a press pass. And uh, so, and there's, and he came because he knows everything. He's in the press tent for, forever. And he's, he's, um, he said, Paddy Smith, he's doing a secret gig in the woods. And oh, and oh, and, uh, there's, um, so we're, we're up there. And, uh, she, you know, it's a piano stage in the woods. And I watch him. She finishes a set. And Ned did exactly what I what I'd done, what I told him to do in, in Cambridge. He leapt up on the stage. He was the only reporter who got an interview with Patty Smith. She sat for 20 minutes on the sofa with him in the piano lounge getting getting it's uh, um brilliant you know and she's always talking about encouraging young artists and she does walk her talk well if that was any indication she walks her talk anyway, we could go but this, <laughs> this could go into a three million hour uh, reminiscence of back backstage <laughs> i'll ignore the one about how my how my my rotten ten-year-old son wore his pay his 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 pass off his belt, and the big bouncers couldn't look at it properly. And he got on stage with all the families and sat on the edge of Bob Dylan on the stage at a Bob Dylan concert. And I've hated him ever. You know, <laughs> I've never forgiven him for that. <laughs> anyway, we'll leave the stage. We'll leave the stage for now, and um, we'll we'll take our magic carpet. And we'll fly across to Canada, um, where Norman is waiting. And I know he's he's actually not cheating because when when we were getting ready to start, he still had his radio or television on, and there was the Canadian weather forecast coming over. So so he's he's, he's actually there. <laughs> so, uh, please, uh, thank you, Orla. That that was fantastic. And please, can we put our hands together and welcome Norman Perrin? Thank you. Um, happy to be here. Oh Lord, so many stories. You know what? Stories create stories that create stories. Um, I left something in the chat. It's called Give Me. I used to work at a, a special outdoor interactive arts program called the Spiral Garden uh, in a ha rehab hospital for children. I'm quite familiar with ramps access and some pretty interesting shenanigans, including Sabura, who managed to get some uh, stage hands to carry her 500 pound power chair up a set of one story of stairs to get into a good seat. So um, there's lots of access stories there. But I, I have a few, a couple stories. I will try and make sure that they all fit together. But the first story that I wasn't planning on telling, but it just ha it wants it to be told. And I'll give you a wee bit of context. I'm just standing, waiting for uh, a miracle. After a whole series of miracles, I'm in Lady Bank, just outside of Edinburgh. And I am there to attend Duncan Williamson's funeral somewhere. And I had left Canada the, that morning and uh, arrived and after several miracles, found myself in Lady Bank. The funeral was in an hour's time and I didn't know where it was when a voice behind me said, are you going to Duncan's funeral? I turn around, tall gentleman, and uh, he says, yes, how could you tell? He says, well, it didn't look like you're from around here. Fast forward to Edinburgh itself, and I'm walking through the crowd of the International Arts Festival. That's the way I go through crowds sometimes, just playing for having the fun of it. I'm on my way to the launch of Duncan Williamson's latest posthumous book, happily unaware that the venue had been sold out for weeks afterwards. And I had not a hope in Hades of making it into the tent. When suddenly a voice behind me said, 
Are you going to Duncan's book launch? I thought I'd heard that kind of voice before. And I turned around and there was this man standing there and he said, and I said, yes, I'm, I'm on my way there. He says, yeah, you look like the sort of person who would go to something like that. And because of the whistle as well. And he said, my friend couldn't make it. And I have an extra ticket. It's a VIP ticket and it gives you all access. And uh, so I got to attend. There was Linda Williamson uh, doing the honors and whatnot. And the tent, I must admit, was quite sumptuous in its food and its drink. And I partook of the most of all of it. And actually, I think the best part is I got this story. Once there was a king, a king who had three sons. And he was knew that his time had come. And so he said to his three sons, one of you, one of you will be king after me. But I do not know which one of you should be king. And so I have set you a task. You have a bag of gold each. And with that bag of gold, you must make the best house possible to live in. Now, three sons, they thank their father. And each, uh, and the first two sons, he, I won't say whether the oldest or the youngest, two of the sons went immediately to building. They got the best woods, the best carpenters, the best stonemasons. And soon there was, uh, foundations were dug, foundations were built, walls were, and they were hammering and building. And meanwhile, the third son, was just wandering around from various parts of the kingdom, from town to town. And what was he doing? He was throwing parties. Every town he went to, he was welcome. He says, because word started getting around. Hey, when he comes, it's party time. And the people would come. And of course, in the country of Africa, a party is not just drinking. A party is dancing. A party is music. A party is storytelling. And the, uh, the young uh, prince enjoyed the music. He danced, he played, he heard the stories, and he carried the stories he learned from town to town to town. Until at last, when the time was up, the first two sons had magnificent houses with wonderful gardens around them. And the third son had nothing. Nothing, no house, no... And, but it was time for the king to visit the households. He went to the first one and he saw the intricate carvings. He saw the gardens and the servants and he said, you have done well. And to the second son, he said the same thing. And now what do you think he said to the third son who replied, well, father, I spent all the money on parties where people danced, where people played music, where people told stories, and where I told stories. And the king said to his three sons assembled, it's the third son who is the wisest of all, who has built the greatest house of all. Because what he has done is built a house of all the homes in the kingdom. There's not a single household that he will not be welcome. There's not a single person in the whole kingdom who will not see their king and know them and respect him. Therefore, the best house of all is the one built by my youngest son. That's the story of the best house of all. And... I think that uh, is this. I had another story, but that's those are the two that came to me. And I'll just end with the words that I put in the chat room. A young boy standing at the edge of the sand pit at the spiral garden spoke spoke to the other young children, saying, "Give me space, three steps, and I will build the world." Oh. 
Norman, it's always a pleasure. And uh, <laughs> it's fantastic. And, that, and, and the memories of Duncan as well. I mean, just, yeah. just great. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, had the privilege of getting on stage at the... Um, they did a thing at the Scottish Storytelling Centre uh, 10 years to, you know, 10 years after his death as a memorial. And uh, so many, so many great people, including uh, Jimmy, his, uh, his, um, his son, came up and sang a song. Brilliant, brilliant night. Uh, so uh, and thank you. That just brought it all flooding back. And great story, great story. There's been some great memories tonight. I mean, just, just you know, I mean, like all are bringing Bonnie Raitt's memory to us and uh, stuff. And uh, last off memories, but that was uh, that, that was prison work. That's a different kind of memory. Um, and uh, just just everything. And we're going to finish with um, we're going to our last teller tonight. What is um. Is someone I've met quite recently. Uh, but don't you? Isn't this great meeting people on this Zoom? This Zoom has brought us brought us people we didn't know before. Uh, so I've met I've met David Thompson uh, recently, and uh, so um, and David, have you got a story for us? You're you're muted still. Uh, I do though, uh, but. Uh, that's okay. So, uh, do you want to, or or, or are you going to pass up and do and come next Sunday? No, I'd I'd rather do it right now. Okay. 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 What that do we over the local go and do we the the in the good good world. What do we have it is no do we have what is that do we that more? Yeah. The AR the do my letter. They not know or there are that working to gain the gain gain or a out gain the unknown or do all so they work at well. They pull that man or the mountain lead that old man to get a good at him or at him. That okay. Though that not working, that led no that now the oh I am that now I not now though. And that man walking by, I said that man not know or I am. So that led my walking. And that was 
Just stories around the world, David. Stories around the world. Uh, not really. No, or do ah. Oh. And we wait. <laughs> Take a while to learn everyone. But, well, it's been an amazing night. It has been an amazing night. Thank you. Let's have a one more, more round of applause for Jane. And all our <laughs> Norman. David, and thank you all for coming without Jan and without Ian and without all those people that are listening and Nicole and Lucy, you know, we're, there's, we'd just be telling stories to each other. Uh, once more, I'm feeling like I'm sitting in a circle. Uh, you know, it's, we, we, we will meet, in, meet physically soon, but at the moment and so tomorrow an hour earlier at five we've got our young international tellers so we have tellers uh, coming from all all over the world quite a few coming from gaza um next sunday is uh next sunday oh, yeah. is is our world story worldwide story story round so you're all welcome to that come and come to that uh tell a story sing uh, tell a story poem anything you like really um and that's uh that that's just uh that's at six o'clock on next sunday Ina, i'm still waiting to hear a story from you sometime <laughs> I, 
I'm expecting you next Sunday. <laughs> um, and Julio, thank you for driving the bus. Thank you.